out. All right. Hey, welcome back to the Group Project Podcast. This is episode number 100. And ten, and hey, I'm here with uh, somebody who I'm pretty familiar with at this point. We've done a couple of collaborations. We he's been a a good mentor to me. Has kind of done some kind of some speaking and some writing things. His name is Doctor Darren Pepper. Doctor, I always want to call you Doctor P, Doctor Pepper, but Doctor Pepper, man, uh, hey, welcome to the show, man. <laughs> Hey, thanks, Jared. I appreciate that so much. Dr. Smith, thank you so, so very much. Um, Yeah, you you know what, let me let me just give you a quick story right off the bat when when you hit that. Um, I got my doctorate in 2017. And actually, uh, the the job where I became superintendent, I interviewed and the next day I walked across stage to, to, you know, be hooded with my with my doctorate. And that first year, I'm I'm in the kindergarten or in the uh, elementary school hallway. And a group of I think they were third graders are coming by. And, you know, it's, hi, Dr. Pepper, hi, Dr. Pepper, hi, Dr. Pepper. And about the eighth kid just launches into the, the thing from the Dr. Pepper commercial. He's like, uh-huh. it's the sweet one. <laughs> and then he looked at me and froze. And I'm like, dude, that is so cool. I awesome. love that. Gave him a high five. So, <laughs> yeah, the whole Dr. Pepper, Dr. Pepper, I mean, yeah, that, it is what it is. It's all I good. Bet. I bet. Oh, that's, I, I literally just today bought Dr. Pepper for a couple of secretaries uh, either way, but, uh, but dude, Hey, you do, you, I, I mean, I'm excited. I was reading your bio before we got started, obviously try to research guests a little bit, dude, you've done it. Everything you've done it all, man. Uh, I'm just going to read this real quick. Uh, this school district yeah. superintendent, speaker, author, publisher, consultant, uh, and you've won some awards, which we'll probably get into, but um, maybe, you know, I always start off with the same question. Like, tell us about your leadership journey. Like, how did you get to this point? Dude, I, you've got yeah. like a, you've got all kinds of stuff, but maybe kind of just give a summary of, of yeah. where you've been and what you're doing. Yeah. Well, and the one you didn't mention, um, which is the one that I'll always identify with is the high school principal role. I mean, I, I consider myself a recovering high school principal. I mean, even five years after being a, being a high school principal, I'm still in recovery and always will be um, and recovery because I loved it, not because it was a traumatic experience. Yeah. Um, honestly, I think my leadership journey, um, it goes back to my first principal. Uh, her name's Betsy Parker. I got to see her last month. Um, she still lives in, in the town where I taught uh, when she, when she hired me. And she, to me, I think is probably the first person that used the word leadership in my name in the same sentence. I mean, like, I seriously don't even think in elementary school, I was like chosen to be a line leader even. I mean, it just, <laughs> that was just how my thing. I was never a team captain or any of those kinds of things. But um, I remember Betsy saying to me at the start of my second year, she's like, you know, Darren, you really need to think about going into leadership. And, you know, I probably looked at her kind of sideways or something, but she's like, no, I'm serious. You know, you really have, you have some leadership potential and some leadership skills. And so that kind of, kind of got me moving into that. And the next year I, I was named department head in, in that school. Then a couple of years later, I moved to the high school level and became the department head within a year. And um, I was a head coach. Honestly, Jared, the reason I went into education was I wanted to be a head basketball coach. And, oh. and I did achieve that, uh, achieve that goal and had a wonderful time uh, as a head basketball coach. But I knew at a point in time that, you know, things were going to change. And um, my wife and I, our, our daughter was, I think, five years old when I finished my master's degree. And it was, you know, hey, let's let's have our daughter grow up, you know, around cousins and aunts and uncles, grandparents, that kind of thing. So we moved back to Wyoming and I was fortunate enough to to uh, land a position as an assistant principal at the high school level. Discipline and attendance. Yeah, there you go. Right. That's such a great job. Yeah. That job's always open because nobody wants it. Um, You know, they're ready to move on to the next one. And uh, I did that for two years. It was a great learning experience. And I know we're going to talk about, you know, some lessons learned and I'll come back to to that particular role. Um, Three years uh, in another assistant principal position, same building uh, in charge of curriculum instruction, special programs. a great, great role for me to grow and learn in. It was an incredible role. And then was fortunate enough to be named principal of that high school. And um, after a really good run there, including being my daughter's principal, um, accepted a superintendent position in Colorado, did that for four years. And yeah, now I'm running road to awesome, man, as educational uh, consultant and motivational speaker. And we run a small publishing house too. So there you go. That's, That's me in a nutshell. There's so much to unpack here. Gosh, there, I, 
you know, I, one of the questions I didn't write down, but Wyoming, you were in Wyoming for a number of, a number of years yeah. there. Any crazy, like, uh, weather stories or oh, travel gosh. stories as a, as oh, yeah. a school leader. Yeah. I, I just, I got it. I've just heard some crazy stories yeah. out West in that neck of the woods. Is there a story you can share? Oh yeah, absolutely. There's one that jumps right to mind. And I will say, you know, just, just for starters and for those watching, I mean, I'm, I'm wearing my Wyoming shirt. I am I a Wyoming kid. That. I grew up in I Casper, um, undergrad and doctor from the university of Wyoming. My daughter just graduated from the university of Wyoming. Um, well, not just, I guess it was a year ago, but um, yeah. So I, I think it was maybe my, I don't know, second or third year. Uh, I think it was my second year as an assistant principal. And we were going to the University of Wyoming job fair. So there was a group of four of us, um, our, our assistant superintendent, uh, HR director, and three other school leaders. And we climb in the district suburban and we head east on I-80 and when we left Rock Springs, the weather was okay. I mean, it's it's March in Wyoming, so you never know. Every, you know, five minutes, and Iowa is the same, and so is Nebraska. But um, we got to Rollins, which is a hundred miles away, and the road was closed, and it never reopened. Um, we ended up we we never made it past Rollins. We were a hundred miles from home. We stayed ended up staying the night because we were hopeful we could still get to the job fair the next morning, and what had happened was just this insane blizzard coupled with there's a stretch just east of Rollins where like most of the category five winds in the United States are found. Um, and they cross I-80 and they had blown several semi-trucks over, one of which had electronics in it and it melted the highway. So that's why the road got closed. So there we sat in Rollins and we had a good time, but uh, <laughs> never made it to Laramie that year. Made it to that job fair many, many times, but not that year. Oh, I mean, there's so much, I, you know, I, I love when people bring up stories. I've never been to Wyoming, uh, but I'm looking, you know, you could, uh, Highway 80. I mean, that's, that's one that cuts right through Iowa. You live, I mean, you currently live in Omaha, which cuts right through mm -hmm. 80 cuts right through I'm Omaha I, too, yeah. right? Yeah, oh, and when man. I was in Rock Springs, I lived on I-80. And it was funny when we left Rock Springs and went to uh, went to Grand County, Colorado, I remember telling my wife, man, I'm so glad we're off of I-80. And here we are back on I-80. So, uh, but, but we don't have to travel it near as much as we used to. So that's okay. Thing. University of Wyoming. I know I'm going way off here, Darren, but uh, that's fine. Most famous alumni who give me one or two most famous alumni from Wyoming. Sure. Well, the big one at the top of everybody's mind, and the day we're recording this is the first round of the NFL draft is tonight. Josh Allen, the quarterback from yes. uh, the Buffalo Bills, yes. you know, University of Wyoming grad. Yes. Um, yeah. I mean, there's, man, there's so many. Um, I, I'm thinking mostly I'm thinking athletes, athletes um, yep, yep. you know, I'll, I'll stay in the NFL. Uh, the Cincinnati Bengals, you know, made it all the way to the Super Bowl. Um, their middle linebacker, Logan Wilson, is a University of Wyoming grad. Oh. Um, you know, actually, I, I think there's probably 15 or 20 UW kids in the NBA or in the NFL right now. Yeah. Um, there's a bunch. But here, I'm going to give you this one. OK, maybe the most famous. And a lot of people don't realize that this person grew up in Wyoming, actually in Torrington, Wyoming, on the far east side of the state. The former owner of the Los Angeles Lakers, Jerry Bust, grew up oh. in Torrington, Wyoming, and went to the University of Wyoming. He the, the Bust family is. I know we're getting mm -hmm. way off here, but man, I feel like way, I way off. <laughs> I always hear of the Bust family and the and their the yeah. ownership of the Lakers and the yeah. you know just. The, the family dynamics and all that. So he was um, the creator of that whole Showtime stuff back in the eighties with Magic Johnson yeah. and and Kareem Abdul Jabbar and James Worthy, and Byron Scott and AC uh, AC Green and on and yes. on and on. Yes. Anyway, yeah. we can talk sports all the time, oh. but I know that's oh, not why you have yeah. me on. Here. Well, I just love I love the mix of like pop culture and and look geography and stories and all that so we might we'll come back to that a little bit but hey you talked sure. about principal superintendency assistant principal i always love asking you know what are the biggest lessons learned and i think you have a very good perspective now and i'm going to get into this like coaching admin teams and coaching leaders and consulting but you know looking back on those first years of being of whatever step of leadership journey you know what were some of those lessons learned 
You know, ooh, a bunch. <laughs> um, but I'll I'll tell you that the first one that that always comes to mind is you know as as a young leader, and I think a lot of young leaders fall into this trap. Man, it's not about you, and you have to understand that when they hired you, they hired you for who you were, not for you to then go and think you have to be Superman. Um, you know, I I had this I had this struggle my first year as a principal and. Literally, Jared, it was 40 feet from the office where I was an assistant principal to the principal office. And that 40 feet, I mean, it might as well have been 400 miles because <laughs> the difference, not only the difference in the job, but I think the difference in my mindset. Um, and man, I kind of hate this about me, but for a while, I thought it was all about me and and not that it was, hey, look at me, but rather it was, I had to have the answer to every question. I had to speak first in every meeting. I had to solve every problem. I, 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 I. And that is so wrong. That is not, that's not even leadership. I mean, it's it's barely micromanagement. It's it's borderline psychotic. But but all of us fall into that trap, right? You know, where we just think that's that's how we're supposed to be, you know. Oh gosh, I'm in charge now. I better know it all. And yeah, it is That's crazy. True. <laughs> Darren, I asked this question. I've asked this question probably the last 60 episodes, probably 50 of the episodes, people have given that same exact answer. It is crazy. And you're nodding your head. Yes. Do you, and I'm going to jump ahead a little bit, but you consult with admin teams now are, you know, and, and you provide training, you know, you, you, and we'll talk about kind of some of the things that you offer, mm-hmm. but are you seeing, do you see that a lot in the field too? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. I think, uh, I think often, um, it, it, maybe it's imposter syndrome, maybe it's a defense mechanism, but we get this, we build this barrier up around us as leaders. And I see it with a lot of leaders that I work with that they almost don't want to admit that they don't know something. And, and that's okay. You know, I mean, but again, I was there, you're nodding your head. Yes, too. So you were there too, but um, I do see that quite often. And, you know, the thing that, that I will do with, with leaders and leadership teams is, is push back with, you know, let's, let's get back to what's important to you what do you truly value? Because, you know, I mean, the values that we have are going to come out in our schools um, in, in great principle or what great principles do differently. Todd Whitaker talks about that, how, you know, even, even somebody who's not a strong leader, their values are going to come out and, and they're going to be emulated by the staff. So we need to make sure we're real clear about what really matters to us and just stay focused on that instead of thinking we have to be like this you know, omniscient, you know, God of leadership, because that's just, it's a fallacy and it's, it's not possible. Yeah. No. So, Hey, that's a great example. I mean, I, again, I am, it just amazes me how many people refer back to, as they reflect on those first years about just that feeling of, they felt like they had to know it all and be the only person who had the answers. Any other lessons that you can think of um, uh, that you look back and like you shake your head like, man, what was I thinking? Yeah, I think uh, well, it definitely ties in with the first one, but um, listen, listen and listen some more. Um, you know, and this this actually became something that I worked really hard to grow with all of the the leaders I was working with as, you know, first as a principal, you know, growing my assistant principals and department leaders, and then as a superintendent growing, you know, that, that greater group. But we have this tendency sometimes to listen for something that we can then respond to. And then we start formulating our response. And instead one of the biggest things I learned, and I honestly, I learned this from my predecessor in that principalship, He was so good at this. Um, There were times where we even asked him about it and he was intentional that he would, he would be the last one in the room to speak. You know, let's make sure everybody gets an opportunity Mm -hmm. to put something out there. And and if he did speak before everybody had, it was like, you know, Jared hasn't spoken. Jared, I'd like to hear what your thoughts are, you know, to, to ensure that all voices were being heard, but also because 
he wanted to have the opportunity to process what everybody was saying and not to respond, but rather, you know, just simply to hear it. And he was so, so good at that. And it's something that I think a lot of times, especially early career leaders, they struggle with that because again, they think they have to be right about everything. So Jared, partway through what you're, what you're saying, I heard what I needed and I'm going to interrupt you and I'm going to shut you down and I'm going to tell you why that's, that's real. That is such a bad step for a leader. Most people just want to be heard. So give them that space, let them be heard. I, I love everything you you're I'm just not in my head like crazy because I agree with everything you're saying there. Hey, you've got a really unique perspective and I want to hear your, your thoughts. You served as an assistant principal, a principal. Well, you, uh, you mentioned like the recovering high school principal idea, the, the superintendents, you know, we, the, the audience here is educational leaders, whether they're aspiring leaders or current leaders, as you reflect on those different positions, um, what advice can you give listeners about what position might be best for them? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, I think one of the things that you want to do, and, and we tend to, you know, as assistant principal or going into a role, we're going to jump at the first opportunity we get because we want to get into that role. Yep. And yep. that, you know, as a secondary guy, that meant discipline and attendance, whether that was going to be middle yep. school or high school for yep. me and end up being high school. Um that really didn't fit my personality, um, but it was an entry and, and, a, and a step into the door. I think one of the things that's really important is obviously getting the opportunity to get in and learn because you might feel that, oh, these are the strengths that I have. You know, as a classroom teacher, I'm really good at this, 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 and this. And I, you know, people tell me I'm good at these couple of things, but maybe a role that you think that's where your skills are, are going to best be utilized isn't necessarily the right role for you. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it's important to, to take the opportunity and find, find a role that is going to stretch you. That's going to challenge you that maybe is going to let you discover things that you didn't realize could be strengths of yours. Um, I had an assistant principal that I had hired for the curriculum role. When, when I became principal, I hired her, a couple of years in, but to take that curriculum instruction and special programs role. And I thought it was going to be a great role for her because she was so good at that as a director of one of our career academies, as a classroom teacher. And the truth was that really wasn't a good role for her. Um, she, she needed to be a building level principal. She ended up leaving and taking an elementary principal role and then came and got the high school principal role when I left. But um, sometimes, yeah, we, I think we pigeonhole ourselves into our head Um, And I'll give you a quick story. When I applied for the position for that first assistant principal position, I remember being in the room uh, and the, and the interview group, uh, there were four people in the room interviewing me and they asked me, you know, Hey, what, what is your ideal job? And I pointed at the athletic director who still to this day is a really good friend of mine. Thank goodness. Uh, And I pointed at him, I said, that guy's job, you know, I wanted to be an athletic director. And I thought, man, that's what I want. And I think a lot of coaches think that too. But what I learned was the amount of time that the ADs spend at the school, you know, be, not that I didn't spend a ton of time there anyway, but maybe that wasn't necessarily the role I wanted. And a couple of years later, the opportunity came and I could take that role or I could take the curriculum role. And that was where I finally had a moment where I could decide mm-hmm. my future, where I think I want to go this curriculum role is going to be the one that's going to make the difference for me. And had I not had the experience in a role that maybe wasn't the one I wanted, I don't think I could have understood how to make that decision. I would have just said, woohoo, AD, that's what I want. Yep. I don't think I would have been as happy. That's really good advice. I think I was in, the, I felt the same way. I, I remember thinking when I, when I started my admin journey, I was like, Oh, it's athletic director. That's where it's at. I, because I love, I coached, yeah. I love sports. I loved athletes. I loved working with kids, but you're mm-hmm. right. I mean, each, each position has its uh, <laughs> pros and cons. And one of the, I guess you could say one of the difficult pieces of athletic directors, man, just the hours you put in and the nights and oh, yeah. the, and just some of the, you know, it's not always the glory, I guess. So great, great. Well, when you there. think about what do you think about like, like the high school I was at was, was a fairly good size high school, you know, 1400 kids. Um, 
ran the gamut of sports. And so, yes. you know, sure to the basketball coach, it looks like, yeah, the AD, that's a great job. He comes to the games and okay. Well, what you don't see is there's a swim meet going on. Also, there's a soccer game going on. There's the basketball game. Um, I mean, on and on and on, in addition to, you know, all the other supervision duties and those kinds of things they have during the day. So yeah, it's, yeah. Once you get a chance to, you get in there, just learn, pay attention to what everybody else's role is, because I think that's the best way for you to figure out what's going to be a good fit for me. Great point. Hey, before, right when we get, right when we started, I mentioned you won a couple of awards here. I'm going to kind of share those real quick. You were the, uh, the Wyoming secondary principal of the year. Uh, and then there, I also noticed right after that, I think you were the Jostens Renaissance educator of the year. Maybe I had those two mixed up, but either way you won these two really big awards. Mm -hmm. And one thing I see is John, you know, Jostens, the, the, they're known for culture climate. And as I read through your, you know, I looked at your website, I've read your blog posts. I've, I've seen, you know, kind of the topics of your speeches that you, that you deliver culture and climate is huge. Maybe talk to us. Why is culture and climate so big? And then maybe give us a couple of examples that you would highly recommend that school leaders put into their uh, professional practice. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, and it's interesting, you know, you mentioned Jocelyn's Renaissance. And for me, that was that was the turning point. So I take this position as, as an assistant principal in charge of discipline and attendance. And unbe unbeknownst, and honestly, I fell right into it. So it's not like I was like, oh, we can't do that. The culture of the school and the culture of our leadership team, culture of our teachers was we catch people doing things wrong. And in truth, we were good at it. I mean, really good at it. And I mean, I like, I knew where to hide to catch kids when they were skipping class or which restrooms there, there was a good chance they were going to go and smoke. I mean, I, I knew where to search kids and where they would hide their tobacco, like between their toes and their socks. <laughs> I shouldn't know that, but I, but I learned it because I had a probation agent with me like all the time and an SRO. And anyway, we were really good at catching people doing things wrong. And partway through my first year, we're in, we're in this staff meeting and, you know, it's the staff meeting where we were going to solve the two most important questions in education. You know, you know, them. what are we going to do about hats and what are ah. we going to do about cell phones? Yeah. <laughs> that's what this, that's what this meeting was about. And because, you know, I'm in the role that I'm in, I got to facilitate the meeting and we're somewhere between, you know, put them in those calculator racks. And, you know, if you just smash one with a hammer, they'll get the message. You know, <laughs> one of, one of the social workers raised her hand and she's like, Darren, why does it always have to be about what they do wrong? Why can't it be about what they do right? And right there, the switch cool. turn. Cool. And I remember looking around the room and there were, there were a bunch of people in the room that, that froze at that. There were a lot that, you know, were like, ah, whatever, you know, flowery social worker, you know, but, <laughs> but for the most part, I mean, people were like, Whoa, wait a minute now. And I had a conversation with, with a handful of those folks and with, um, with the building principal. And I just said, you know, we gotta do something about our culture. I mean, I didn't realize it, but, but we are, we're toxic. And Jocelyn's Renaissance was a program that we had at the high school where I was a teacher. And all I knew about it was kids who got good grades got to go early on Fridays and they got a reserve parking place. It's all I knew about it, yeah, but yeah. put a group together. We went to our first Renaissance conference in 2007 and Holy cow. It is just, I mean, it's a rock concert for three days of the who's who in education talking about how they build positive culture and climate and how they let students work to build positive culture and climate. And I was hooked and our school was hooked. And we went from, from a, a really negative place with a terrible grad rate and a terrible attendance rate and unbelievable amounts of fights in the hallway to the best graduation rates in the history of the school. By the time, you know, I was finishing up my last couple of years as principal and incredible attendance. And anyway, the long and the short of it was we had to switch our focus, you know, instead of focusing on the things they were doing wrong, we had to focus on the things they're doing right. You know, there's, there's still consequences for policy violations. I mean, I'm not saying we didn't do that, but Instead of me managing 2,000 discipline referrals for 1,100 kids my first year, the next year it was 460. You know, we weren't sending kids to the office because they didn't bring a pencil. You know, I gave that teacher a, a case of pencils. Give them a pencil. Quit sending them to the office. Well, what if I run out of pencils? Let me know. I'll bring you more. You know, let's stop to, you know, take away the excuses. 
Let's focus on the things you're doing, right? We had a lot of great things, Jared, happening in that school, but we didn't see them, you know? And so um, here's a good way to think about this. And, and I'll challenge you and the listeners um, all at the same time. When you drive home tonight or when you're driving to work in the morning, when you're listening to this, whenever you're in your car, count the number of red cars you see. Just count the number of red cars. I can tell you right now, you're going to see a ton of them. And the whole reason is because you're looking for them. You know, if, if I had told you blue cars, you'd have found, a, you know, a ton of blue cars. When you focus on what you're looking for, it's there. We just had to turn our focus to what was good instead of what was bad. So it made a huge difference in the culture of our school. Um, you know, again, we weren't shining the spotlight on all the bad things that were happening. We were shining the spotlight on the good things, you know, and <laughs> all of a sudden dropout rate stopped. It well, didn't stop, but it decreased dramatically. Um, our teacher turnover rate went down, um, you know, and as the leader, it started with me. I had to change how I showed up every day. You know, I had to show up and bring the positive energy instead of hiding in bathrooms to catch kids smoking. You know, let's, let's go be at the front door and say good morning and hello and call people by names, you know, and, and you know, go talk to the bus drivers and say hi to the parents and just be a positive leader. I mean, I think I've squirreled a little bit off of your question, but that's, to me, that's, that's why culture is important because the values that we have as leaders are going to permeate our school, whether we're a good leader or a bad leader. And when we're a bad leader, it permeates the school. When we're a good leader and we're focused on the positives, guess what? Everybody else starts doing the same thing. And they realize, hey, this is a pretty good place. And this is where we want to be. Gosh, there's so much I want to ask you about. Uh, I've heard a lot about the Justin's Renaissance conferences. I've never gone. You mentioned you you took teams, or if 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 somebody's wanting to uh, check these this stuff out, like what what system would you recommend? Would bringing teams? Is it teams of teachers? Is it yeah. admins? Is it students? What would you recommend if they if they want to hop sure. on the Justin's bandwagon? Yeah. So, um, yeah, the first year I went, uh, there were, I think we took seven adults and eight kids and, um, it, it was in Orlando. It's usually in Orlando. So, you know, not a bad place to go. Um, but you know, you want to have people who have influence in the school. Um, you know, as, as a, a coach for Jocelyn's Renaissance for many, many years, I would recommend to people you know, get, get one of your principals there or your assistant principal, or, you know, somebody who can help lead the charge. Um, as a superintendent, I went every year. Um, you know, I, I tried to get our superintendent to go, um, never did get the superintendent to go, did get superintendent's kid on our team and, <laughs> and got to go. But, um, but, uh, you know, when you, when you attend that event, you're learning from people from all over the country that have really put a lot of hard work into building and maintaining that positive culture. And right now, because there's so much negativity that is surrounding and being pushed on education, the schools that have been the most successful, and, and you know this because you focus really hard on culture and climate too, the schools that have been successful have been able to weather the storm, so to speak, had a strong culture before all of this started before the pandemic began, before yep. all this COVID fatigue and negativity and political pressures and all this. And I'm not saying it's it's the magic elixir or that it's a, the perfect buffer, but when you're focusing on that, on that culture, when you're focusing on your values, on what's important to you, and then you're recognizing, rewarding, and reinforcing those, and it makes a lot of difference. And, and I would tell you this, anybody who's who's thinking about, you know, the Jocelyn's Renaissance journey, go to jocelynsrenaissance.com. I, I, I get paid nothing for Jocelyn's Renaissance, just for clarity. I, I really don't, but it changed my life. Uh, it changed me as a human being. It changed me as a father. It changed me as a, as a, as a school leader. And I will tell you, you know, go to jocelynsrenaissance.com, click on events. Um, the, the big one is the Jocelyn's Renaissance Global Conference. Um, it's in July this year. It's in Orlando. Um, the first fun night, by the way, is at the Magic Kingdom. So you get to go to the Magic Kingdom as a part of part of the conference. But wow. it is truly, truly, um, to me, it was a life-changing event. Um, so once, and, and I can tell you, there's a lot of people who've told me that too. Once your team comes back then, what, what does it look like? And again, I don't want to go too far down this, but I'm really curious when you come back, what time of, what 
what type of like time commitment mm -hmm. or commitment do you have to have when they return? Maybe just kind of give me some right. ideas on that. Mm -hmm. What we did with our student leadership team, uh, and our student leadership team was usually between eight and 15 kids, uh, similar to like a student council type of thing. And we would partner with student council on a lot of things too. But, um, you know, maybe, maybe it was once every other week, you know, a 30 minute meeting in the morning. But that group then was going to plan and, and put in place all of the different recognitions we were going to do, including we did three academic pep rallies a year. And I mean, you've been to a pep rally, you know, all that kind of stuff. Academic pep rallies done the right way, blow the roof off the place. And so our kids put a ton of work into that, you know, developing script and making sure that, you know, they had like the drum line ready to go and, and all the all the different elements, the different games we were going to play. And, and of course, all the things we're going to recognize and which kids we're going to recognize. And here's where the power is. Uh, I'll just I'll just tell you really quick. When you have a student who goes to the same old assembly year after year and sees the same kids get a certificate for 4.0 or perfect attendance. And that kid's not a, not a poor student, but they're not a high flyer, you know, or maybe they're a kid who's busting their tail to get a two eight, you know? Okay. That kid, that kid disengages. But what if you recognize every kid who hit your attendance goal? Maybe your attendance goal is 93%. Right now, we don't want kids to come to school when they're sick. So why would we recognize perfect attendance? Perfect is hard to do, and it's demoralizing. Also, and this was always my favorite, when we recognize kids who raise their GPA by 0.5 or more in a given semester, and you would see kids, um, man, I, I got chills just thinking about this one particular young man, kid named Michael. Michael, his senior year, just turned it all around, and... You know, he had like, a, I don't know, two seven, but he was running with like a 1.8. And when Michael's name was called, I knew where he was sitting and I looked right at him and his buddies were like, what? <laughs> <laughs> you know, and he gets up and he is just struck. Oh. He's like, oh yeah, <laughs> look at me. I'm getting recognized. And, we, and you don't recognize him with a certificate because certificates just go in their drawers. Nah, you do something fun. You do something, you know, that's meaningful, that's that they can walk around in like a t-shirt or, you know, or something like that. And, you know, it just, it makes a difference in the culture when kids realize, you know, hey, this, this isn't just about the royal family. You know, it's not just about the 4.0 and the star quarterback. It's, it's about everybody who's working hard. Man. Yeah. I I, I, we've got staff here in my district, my current district that are huge believers in Justin's Renaissance. We've had some bumpy, like uh, a couple of COVID and, you know, it's been a couple of bumpy years, but I'm like, I want to, they've been asking if they can go to the conference and we've always been like, well, we'll see. But like, oh man, I Make love it. Happen. I love the Make ideas of happen. kids going and then empowering them when they come back to like lead the charge. Uh, they do a whole morning now, or I think it's the first two hours of the conference that are all student POV sessions. So it's students from all over the country that are presenting as a collective group from their school. Here's what we are doing and sharing their stories and ideas. And your kids will come back with a billion ideas, more than they can ever put in. Very cool. Very cool. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to shift gears to like what you're currently doing before I do that. Is there sure. anything else leadership? I mean, we're going to keep talking about leadership, but is there anything else yeah. uh, reflecting on your time as uh, in the buildings that you want to make sure you share real quick? Oh, uh, <laughs> you know, I think, I mean, there's so much, oh, there right? Is. Um, I know. I, know. I, I guess here's, here's the one thing I will say, and, and I think I've kind of hit it, but I want to make sure I hit it with the right words. And that's, as a leader, there's so many different hats we wear and so many different responsibilities we have, but I really feel like, and again, this goes back to that moment when, when two roads diverged for me, this is where the road to awesome began when it was, why well, it's always got to be about what to do wrong. To me, as, as a leader, if we can make sure each and every day that everybody, kids and adults alike, feel like they're seen, they're heard, and they're loved, and that they are part of something special, that's leadership. Mm -hmm. That is leadership. Yeah, you're going to get test scores to go up and you're going to get whatever. 
you're in the human, you're in the, in the business of human beings, right? I mean, our, our job, Jared, is to take a human being and in nine months, make them a little bit better human being. Mm. That's really our job. God, let them be seen and heard and loved and let them know that they're in some place special. You know, it's amazing what they do. Uh, good stuff, man. Hey, if you're joining us late, this is Dr. Darren Peppard. Uh, he, he does it all. Former superintendent, former, uh, former principal, former assistant principal. And we're going to shift into what you're currently working on, which again, I read those things off earlier. Speaker, author, publisher, which is very cool. Consultant. Uh, and my first question is like, dude, is there such, what does a normal day look like for you now? Is there such thing as a normal oh, day or what, what is, what are you up to these days? Yeah. You know, uh, the life of the entrepreneur, there's no such thing as a typical day, but, but that's also true. You know, when, when you're a principal or a superintendent, no such thing as a typical day, but you know, for me, um, one of the bigger struggles was getting into a routine and, you know, really figuring out, you know, what is, what's my day look like? So, you know, um, I'm, I'm sipping coffee at, you know, at seven o'clock, as opposed to screaming out the door, you know, headed for a parking lot somewhere. Yeah. Um, you know, get, get my workout in, you know, at eight 30 or whatever. I think I went at eight, eight 45 this morning. There's like two people at Atlanta fitness. It's, it's beautiful. Um, but, uh, you know, it's, it's a lot of conversations. Um, in some ways it's similar to being a superintendent just in a different way, because I have probably 20 conversations a day with people. And, you know, sometimes it's, it's, you know, it's in the publishing space, you know, maybe somebody's got an idea about a book or, you know, we're working with a current author who maybe we've got them, you know, we're editing their book and getting ready to, you know, to get their book completed. Um, and then of course the consulting stuff, you consulting and coaching, you know, I'm on with a client at least once a day. Um, sometimes it's two or three times a day. Um, and then I'm an entrepreneur. So it's, it's always the hustle. It's always trying to find more people to have conversations with and, get an opportunity to, to work with them and help them, you know, to solve problems. Um, that's, that's one of the unique things I think about this role is I, I, we were talking earlier about, you know, Hey, don't, don't solve everybody's problems for them, you know, but, um, in this role, that's part of my job. My job is to help solve problems. Yeah. You know, uh, somebody reaches out to me and, you know, man, we're having an issue with the culture in our school. Well, okay, let's have some conversations and let's yeah. talk about what we can do. Or, you know, my leadership team, you know, I just, you know, I'm new in this role and I've got four new leaders and, you know, I just, I need something to make sure we're all on the same page. So it's, you know, two day leadership workshop in the summer or something that I come and facilitate and, you know, build with that leader. It's just a lot of conversations. And, and to be honest with you, taking the dogs outside, getting the dogs out for a walk pretty much every day. That's kind of nice. And you know, some of those things, but yeah, my, my days are different than they used to be, but they go by still just as fast. One thing I, I, and you talked about a number of different like segments of what you offer, but the one thing I always come back to that's unique is that book publishing, you know, that I just feel like I've, um, talked to so many people who are interested. They've got a book idea, but they're just not sure what to do with it. Uh, and they're like, I really want to write something, but I just don't know what the next steps are. Can you, can you maybe yeah. explain what services you offer there? And I guess share a little bit more about that. Yeah. So uh, with, with Road to Awesome Publishing, you know, the idea is books by educators for educators. You know, right now we, we have our leadership series and then we have our, our, our children's book series. And really what it comes down to is people just having a conversation because I think you're right. I think a lot of people who want to write a book or maybe they've even mostly written a book, they just don't know what to do, you know, and maybe they see on social media, oh, well, there's this, this publishing company or, oh, I know this guy and, and such and such company published him and maybe I should reach out to them. And everybody does it a little bit different. Um, all of them are great, by the way. I will say nothing negative about any any of the educational publishers, they are all wonderful. And, um, and you know, and we got some really great help when we started our process with, with Codebreaker. Uh, Codebreaker was the publisher of my book, Road to Awesome. And, you know, Brian was encouraging and, and got us started on this, got us started on this path. But when people reach out to us, and again, this is different for, for every publisher, I don't necessarily want a completed manuscript. 
um, some people think, hey, it's got to be done before I submit it to a publisher. And for some publishers, that's true. Not us. Um, I want to know what's your idea? What are your goals behind this? And not just your personal goals, but what goals do you have for the person who's going to pick up and read your book? Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, every book should do something, you know, should make you the reader go do something. So what's your goal? What do you want to accomplish with that book? Um, and then ultimately when I talk with people, it's, you know, if I like their idea, which usually I do, it's send me a couple of chapters and send me a table of contents with kind of just like, here's a couple sentences about what I think each chapter is going to be. Sure. No, it's not set in stone or anything like that. It's just, here's my concept. Here's my idea. Um, you don't have to have a finished manuscript to get a publishing contract. You really don't. Um, in some cases, yeah, the, there are publishers who, because they have a super deep backlog, maybe they're like, hey, come back to us when it's finished. But we're not at that point. I mean, we're, we're backlogged close to a year at this point. But still, you know, if people are writing, that's a good time to, to have, them, have them working on it and get them under contract. Oh, that's cool, man. So if people want to see the, like the, the books that have been published under your label, can they Mm -hmm. just go to your website then, or where would you put, where Mm -hmm. would you point them? Yeah, absolutely. You go to road to awesome.net and click on the word on the, on the tab that is books. And you can see all of our books there. Um, I think we have it set up even on the homepage at the bottom. They kind of scroll by as like maybe our three or four most recent books. Um, that are there, but yeah, when you click on books, it takes you to all of them. My book also is, is there road to awesome, but, uh, uh, that's cause you can buy it from me too. But, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, all of our books that, that are currently there are, are on the website at road to awesome.com or road to awesome.net. Sorry. And yeah, just click on the books. So let's talk about your book for a minute here. Yeah. Um, Road to awesome and power lead change the game. You know, maybe just kind of just give a sneak peek of what, of what people can expect if they pick up your book. Yeah. Yeah. So when I wrote that book, um, I I had this crazy thought that, oh, there has to be this magic formula for leadership. (laughs) No, that's wrong. Um, Instead, you know, finally somebody gave me some advice and they're like, you know, Darren, just tell your stories. You got a million great stories. Tell your stories. So I wrapped, you know, 20 something years worth of, of stories, not all of them, you know, I, I got to hold some back for book two and book three and then so forth. But, um, you know, a, a handful of really great stories that are connected to what I thought for me were the six most important things for school leadership. Um, those, you know, just, just really quick, be clear on your values and lead from your values, build strong, positive culture, climate, um, just love the educators you have. They're important. Make sure you're loving on them, listening to them and supporting them. Make sure you're empowering your students and giving them real life, important, you know, great experiences in the learning environment. Number five, we got to tell our story. And number six, lead from a coaching perspective. You know, don't, don't focus on, again, on the things people are doing wrong, focus on how can I help grow this teacher, this administrator, this kid, you know, how do I, how do I lead my school essentially as a coach? Um, but the thing that I challenge everybody who reads this book is don't go do the six that I think, you know, but what are the ones that are important to you? You know, when, when you're clear on what's important to you and you lead from that, amazing things can happen. And that's, that's kind of the core of the book. And again, with a lot of great stories, a couple little, little, maybe pull a tear out of your eye, but uh, <laughs> a lot of really good ones. So I, I realize I'm kind of running out of time with you here, but which other is, let's talk about one other segment of what you offer. Do you want to talk about your, your coaching? Do you want to talk about your speaking? You know, you, you tell me what else do you want to share with the audience? Ooh, yeah. So let's, <laughs> let's talk about the stuff when I get in an airplane and go somewhere. So um, that could be speaking at a school or working on site with a leadership team. So um, obviously we're at that time of year right now um, when professional development plans are getting put together. Um, I love to get out and work with leadership teams. Like I said, you know, a new leadership team or a leader who's new to a space and we got to get everybody aligned. We got to get everybody doing exactly what I was just talking about that's in my book. We're all clear on our values. We're all clear on what are we good at? What are the other people good at? How do we work together? How do we hold, our, hold, our, hold ourselves collectively accountable? You know, those types of things. Um, 
that's work I just really love doing. I've, I've already got a whole bunch of them booked this summer, just two day leadership retreats. You know, this as a superintendent, yeah, you can take your team on a retreat, but if you facilitate it, they're just going to tell you what you want to hear. You need somebody else to facilitate. So you can be a part of that, a part of that team and, and actually work with the team. So that's a big, big chunk of what's going on. And then honestly, the, the speaking stuff is the culture and climate stuff. It's, it's going and speaking at schools. I've partnered with a gentleman from St. Paul, Minnesota named Tom Cody from Top 20 Training. Tom is one of the best speakers out there. He and I have a, a thing we're doing called Stay in Your Lane. School Culture Starts With You. That's all about stop it with the blame, stop with the finger pointing, focus on what you can control. And remember that even as a teacher, as a bus driver, as a you know, somebody working in the cafeteria or the superintendent, school culture starts with you. And here are the things you can do. We wrap a whole bunch of stories in there. And then we both also bring our own keynotes, keynotes and workshops to that. So I could go on and on there, but that's kind of when I get in an airplane, I'm doing one of those things. That's awesome. And man. I'm in an airplane a lot. Yeah. <laughs> well, I love, I mean, just, you've just, I, I mean, I, I try to write down the key ideas, Darren, and like, I've got a lot here for you, man. I mean, there's just been so many like Good. great points that I'm like, yeah, that makes sense. Um, so if people want to, re- if people are liking what they're hearing, what's the best way mm-hmm. to reach out to you? So the best way to reach out to me, honestly, is just go to road to awesome.net. Um, every page has a contact form on it. So just hit a contact form. Um, social media, if you want to get me through social media, everything on social media, I'm Darren M. Peppered. So whether that's Twitter, TikTok, uh, Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram. I think that's the big hitters. Huh. I'm Darren M. Peppered on all of those. Just awesome. shoot me a DM. Yeah, whatever. I didn't know you were doing those the TikTok stuff, man. I'm at the, I, I did that for a little bit. <sighs> yeah. I hopped off because I couldn't, I just was spending too much time just looking as, as, I know, as I know you can scroll but... forever. Yeah. <laughs> that's yeah, awesome, man. Hey, okay. I loved it. Let's finish on some quick hitters real quick, if that's okay. Mm-hmm. So I always kind of like put context behind my questions. As I ask you these questions, should we use o- Omaha as your home base? Or what do you, what do you think? Sure. You've been in Omaha for yeah. what? The last, how long have you been in Omaha for? Almost seven months. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So Omaha, I mentioned to you, Darren, I'm going to probably be out there this summer. I always ask the restaurant question. Like what is like the go-to oh, yeah. restaurant you got to check out in Omaha? That's tough. Oh, I would tell you that's that tough. It is tough because there's a bunch. Um, oh, you can't go wrong in Old Market. Um, there's so many great places down there. But I will tell you, our go-to in Old Market is jams. We love jams. If you love big salads, um, oh, their crab cake salad is like the greatest thing on the planet. So I'll go with jams. Love but it. I could easily give you a few more. So, okay. Yeah. Give me, give me one more. Give me one more. Cause I'm going to, I'm going to be there probably okay. for two nights and jams is sounding pretty good right now. Jams is fantastic. Um, still in the old market area, but just a little bit North of there, right at the, at the, at the base of the, um, the stadium where uh, the CHI field, where the college world series is played is a restaurant called black called Blatt's beer and table. And of course it's named after, the old Rosenblatt Stadium. Um, I will tell you their pretzel bites and their macaroni and cheese bites are worth the trip all by themselves. Absolutely it. incredible. And nothing but local beers on tap too. Okay. Oh man. I, I was out there last summer for the College World Series. Great, great time. Uh, and I just, I, I'm just, I, I really want to get out there again. You were probably at Blatt's cause it's right across the street from the Yes. Entrance. No, you're right. We were, they had yeah. like an outdoor, they, I think we were at yeah. the outdoor mm-hmm. part of it. Cause it was a big, huge, yeah. like pregame tailgate, whatever you want to call it, but absolutely. Yeah. That's oh, Blatt's. Very cool. Very cool. Okay. Hey, what is one book that has greatly influenced your life? Ooh, one, I got to pick one. <laughs> um, man. Okay. I can't give you one. I'm gonna give you two, but I'll give them to you quick. Gary Keller, the one thing. Um, this is, this is one from a, you know, from a, from a business perspective, entrepreneur uh, perspective, and also as a leader perspective, the one thing, you know, in a nutshell, what's the one thing you can do such that by doing it makes everything else either easier 
or irrelevant. Yes, Incredible yes, book. Yes. Um, gosh, the other one I'll give you, I got to give you Jimmy Casas, Culturized, man. That's so good. Um, it's, I don't know, Jimmy hit it out of the park. Yep. <laughs> Yep. You know, again, hundreds of good ones. I'm, I'm looking here. I can yes. see all of all yes. of my books over here yes. on the bookshelf. And I just and love Jimmy's giving people jumping right off at me. Oh, so yeah. I went with that one. Yep, absolutely. Yeah. No, I, I completely agree. It has been a long time since I read the one thing. I think I need to bring that back. Out. You know, sometimes you reread a book and it's like, whoa, I missed oh, all yeah. of this stuff the first time I read it. Um, so yeah. very, and I love culturized. Absolutely. <laughs> Especially, yeah. you know, with everything you've talked about so far in this episode, like, Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Usually I ask a question about convenience store. Like what do you grab in the convenience store? How about this though? You're always on airplanes, man. What kind of snack, oh, yeah. if you're grabbing a snack for the air, for the ride, for the, for the flight, what are you grabbing? What are you grabbing at the, at the, uh, the, in, in inside the, uh, airport at that convenience yeah. store in there? What are you grabbing? You know, typically my go-to there, uh, I'm going to get a bottle of water. Uh, although now I've been carrying my, you know, uh, my, what do you call this thing? My hydro flask so I can fill it up inside the airport. Um, but I'm going to get typically um, some type of either a Chex Mix or a uh, uh, maybe, you know, uh, like a, a Gardetto's or something like that. Oh, yeah. And I'm going to get a Reese's peanut butter cups. Ooh, good combo, man. No, you're speaking yeah, my language right now, man. I know. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Can I have a little uh, protein when you're on the plane, a little sugar to keep you awake. Okay. Next question. I got two more for you. Um, you're ultra productive. You talked about, I mean, I just, all the different things that you're doing. I'm, I'm kind of watched from afar. I'm like, man, he's got so many things going that are just like blow my mind. What's your biggest tip for being so productive? <laughs> Oh, that's, that's funny because, because I feel like, uh, I'm all <laughs> over the place. Um, so I would tell you, I, I do two things. Number one, I calendar as much as I possibly can. So I stay on task, um, you know, with, with running the business and it's a family business. So, you know, scheduling our regular meetings. So, so we're staying on, on, you know, on point, um, and then I have, I have in my office and it's not a big office. I have two big whiteboards. You can see one of them here and then there's one yeah. over here. I am constantly writing on the whiteboards. I mean, even like at night I'm brushing my teeth and I'll wander in here and I'll write more stuff on the whiteboard just so that I make sure. And then I get up and erase it as it gets done. Uh, just number one, it feels good to clear the list. Um, and number two, I'm, I'm not as techno as I am, I don't really like doing like an app with, with checklist. I just, I need to write it on the whiteboard. So those are my two so, things. Right okay. There. So it's kind of like a, a to-do list. The, 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 the Pretty whiteboard much. is, yeah. okay. Okay. Cause everybody kind of has their different yeah. styles for what they do on the whiteboard. It's yeah. very, very cool. Mm -hmm. Very cool. Okay. Yeah. I always like asking this, you seem like a very goal oriented person. Like what is like the one big goal right now? Like what is the, like, okay, this is my next big thing. What would that be? You know, I think the big goal that we're operating under, um, and, and I'll, we, we have one in each category, so I'll give you the speaking one. Um, as, as a motivational speaker this calendar year, which by the way, you talk about something tough, spend your whole life like you have at school, K-12, college, now working at a school, and shift then to a January to December calendar. It's, make it's like impossible. <laughs> I know. And my, my accountant is like, no, Darren, we can't go July 1 to June 30. You can't do that. The federal government won't support that. Um, but, uh, and I, I just lost my train of thought with, with telling you that. Um, so the public again, speaking in the one calendar yeah. year. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Speaking. My goal. Yep. Yeah. The goal for this calendar year is 20 full, you know, full fee paid events. And so what I'm doing, I think you're probably your next question is how do you stay on your goals? I, I look at the goals from the end all the way back and it's, you know, this week or this month, the month of April, you know, it's almost over. Am I on track to meet that goal in terms of having things booked? And this week, what do I have to do this week to make sure I'm staying on track in April to meet this goal instead of just waiting until December, you know, Hey, did I make it? You know, yes. rather it's let's keep moving forward. So kind of reminds yeah. me of the Gary Keller, the one thing, like what is the one thing, you know, where kind it comes of focusing. from. <laughs> Very cool, That's man. That's where it comes from. 
I actually heard him on a podcast talking about how he sets his goals and work backwards. And that's where I stole that from. That's cool. That's why I went to that book right away. Cause that one always is. And it's sitting right there. So that's awesome. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. Well, Hey man, is there anything else? I, I promised you 45 minutes. We went a little <laughs> over, but it was just, there's just so many fun things to talk about that. I, yeah. I feel like I can connect with. So anything else you want to say before we uh, take off here? <sighs> You know, I guess the only thing I would say, you know, we've talked about, you know, how to find me, um, you know, uh, the blog uh, is, is Darren Pepper dot, uh, dot edu blogs dot com. And the podcast, um, your podcast is awesome. You were just on my podcast, which is the leaning into leadership podcast. So um, yeah, I mean, if for some reason you listen to me this entire time and want to actually hear me more check out the leading into leadership podcast. Good stuff, man. No, I, I, I really appreciate this conversation, man. I'm telling you, like you're speaking my language, man, in terms of like just yeah. the, your focus, what's, what's most important in schools. Some of the same conversations I feel like we're having here on a daily basis. You're, you're, you're kind of echoing in your, in our conversation. So, Hey man, I'm going to let you go. Enjoy the night. Like I said, I'm going to be out. I'm going to be in Omaha this summer. So let's connect. Let's uh, hang out, happen. maybe go have some of those, what, either crab cake, salad at jams, or maybe some uh, pretzel bites at Blatt's or something. So <laughs> there you go. That sounds awesome, awesome. man. All right. Well, thank you so right, much man. and uh, have a good night. Okay. Hey, thanks.